Designing a building to resist an earthquake can be one of the most complicated tasks you can undertake as a structural engineer, as it requires you to consider many components and different concepts to come together to ensure your structure is stable. I'll be going through some of the key concepts that you need to consider in any earthquake design. Hi, my name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. What you got to realize when you're designing for earthquake, your structure will sustain some sort of damage as it's not feasible to keep the structure in its linear state as all the core and members in the building will need to be in excessive size. So most earthquake designs require some level of damage. How this is defined is ductility. So ductility is a ratio of how much damage the building will suffer under a design event. Obviously you start at non-ductile, which leads to very high earthquake loads and you stay in that linear state. However, most of the time you're designing for a moderately ductile or a ductile structure to allow for those loads to come down, but the structure will still not see its collapse mechanism. And the higher you increase your ductility, so the more damage your structure will suffer, the more detailing requirements you have around your design as you do not want to have a weak link that causes sudden failure in your structure. So this requires specific detailing requirements that will be described in each code around the world. So when you're starting out for your design, what level of ductility you're going to be designing for is highly critical. Earthquake design also has a series of analysis that you can undertake to assess the loads that are imparted upon your structure, each increasing in difficulty and complexity. The first and most simplest design method for analysis is equivalent static analysis or ESA where it essentially simplifies the loads into a static equivalent of force and pushing the building over. So the building sways like a simple pendulum but as we know with any structure when the ground shakes from earthquake that building does not form that simple pendulum shape during an earthquake event as waves will oscillate up the building. So this is a really highly conservative estimation of the design loads. And this is where we move into the one of the most common analysis for earthquake, which is modal response spectrum analysis or MRSA. This is one of the most common analysis that you will undertake in earthquake design. MRSA requires you to assess the modal response inside your building. Like any structure, each building has an oscillation that excites it more. This is similar to the glass when it's subjected to a certain frequency You'll keep vibrating and oscillating until it breaks. Buildings also have similar frequencies that cause peak damage to the structure. So what MRSA does, it assesses all the motor responses in the building. And it can do this through a number of methods. And the most common assessment for this is either eigenvectors or Ritz vectors. Most of the time you go with those eigenvectors as the most common approach. However, in extremely flexible structures, it is not uncommon to change it to a Ritz vector. You see, designing for this modal mass assessment, the critical aspect is to ensure that you have enough modal mass engaged in your assessment. Because essentially what it does, it sums up all these peak frequencies to assess the peak damage. So if you do not have at least 80 or 90% modal mass participation in the modal assessment, you're not assessing the peak loads on your structure. The reason why this method is most adopted is it's still assuming that linear state, so it makes it quite a simple analysis while assessing the building for the peak loads it would see under the worst case scenario. However, as this is a still a simplification, this is where we move on to the next form of analysis, which is when we're moving into the non-linear analysis. And this is where we move into pushover analysis. So what pushover analysis does, essentially pushes the building until it finds that weak link, at which point it is reset with that weak link pulled out and they keep going and they keep pushing until the next weak link is found until the next weak link is found. And they keep doing this either until the building collapses or to prescribed limit. Now this is a non-linear assessment, finding the weak links inside the structure, ensuring the building is still stable during an earthquake. This makes it a highly efficient methodology, however it is increasing the complexity. However, it is still a simplification of what actually happens during an earthquake. As there is a time component to any earthquake, as the building rocks backwards and forwards, it's subjected to a series of frequencies. And this is where we move on to the most complex assessment, the time history analysis. So what time history analysis does, it subjects 
the building to a realistic ground shaking motion and assesses the loads that are inside that structure. There's either two methods that you can do with this. You can either do the linear static, but if you're doing such a complex analysis, why would you? Or you've got a non-linear method similar to the pushover analysis, finding those weak links. Now this is the most complex assessment that you can do on a structure for earthquake and is not done very often. However, it will produce the most realistic results for the damage and design loads that you need to design your building for. As with anything, the more complex assessment you do, the more likely you are to make a mistake and receive garbage results. So when you are doing the more complex assessments, you need to assess it to a more simpler methodology to ensure your results are logical. However, this can be hard as the moments will change with the different analysis methods. But the one thing that stays relatively the same is the amount of shear force the building sees. So typically when you are doing these assessments, you're assessing that you are within a prescribed limit of shear force from the more simpler analysis results. So this is where you need to go back and ensure that your results are correct through checking it through a more simplified method to ensure you haven't made a mistake in the more complex assessment. As we said at the start, most buildings will suffer some sort of flexural yielding during a design earthquake event. These zones are either known as boundary zones or potential plastic hinge zones. And to allow for the flexural yielding to occur in these zones, it requires significant confinement of these peak areas. As if we don't confine them effectively, we have several failure mechanisms that may occur. Either the buckling of the vertical flexural bars or the disintegration of the central core to cause a fatal collapse in the building. So if these areas aren't effectively confined, they potentially will not yield and cause a catastrophic collapse to your building. And so when you are designing a building, making sure you're defining these boundary and plastic hinge zone areas and looking into the code is generally quite prescriptive of how you need to confine these areas to ensure they actually form. So what we need to consider when we're designing for earthquakes is to ensure that the loads actually get to the stability elements. As we can assume that the whole mass of the building is at the center of mass and therefore it needs to get from that location as it's rocking backwards and forwards to wherever the stability elements are. And it does this through the diaphragm. And you can do this through a simplified strut and tie methodology, either having a distributed load across the whole weight of the building as it rocks one way, or from that central mass, essentially drawing a series of strut and tie actions known as feeders and collectors. So essentially the ties will need to be reinforced to ensure that they sufficient to bring the load back to where it needs to go. Another critical aspect to this is also ensure that your connection to the stability elements is sufficient. As we have seen a significant failure in Christchurch where this occurred at the CCTV building, where during a major earthquake, it essentially detached from the building. And as we can see, it pancaked the whole structure. So it's highly critical to ensure that your connections are sufficient and will not fail during an earthquake. There's normally generally some predefined limits to ensure that these connections are not your weak link. For example, in the Australian standards, it requires you to design these areas as non-doctile locations to ensure that they will never fail and other areas of the building will yield well before these areas will ever see a peak design force. Another consideration as well, especially on a building with lots of stability elements, is how stiff each of these stability elements are as the stiffer the element, the more load it will generally attract. So ensuring that you're actually transferring the loads to which stability elements will see them. So to the stiffest, most biggest lever arm locations first, to the softer ones later. So this may require a complex strut and tie model or FE analysis to ensure that the loads are going where you think they're going and you're actually reinforced for it. As there is a number of components inside your structure, so what are the critical elements that you need to look at? Well, the first part of any core that I would look at when I'm scheming a building is the header beams. You see, most buildings have walls and they need some sort of access into the central core. And as you walk into the core with that hole, you have a beam over the top and this is defined as a header beam. This header beam being a smaller element inside your overall core structure is generally the most critical element inside your design. And most of the time will govern the thickness of your core more so than the walls. The other areas is potentially little nibs and corners which may see high peak stresses as well. And when you're getting on your taller buildings, you may actually have outriggers. Now we'll do a whole episode on this later. However, to give you some sort of key concept of what they do, they have big lever arms effectively that allow the forces to strut and tie out to these mega columns to help resist the earthquake loads. 
And what this effectively does is put a reverse moment in those locations. So as the tower is coming up, it's changing the curvature. And so it's putting some forces in those outer edges by pulling out of the central core and changing the curvature of the structure as you go up. And as I said, this is more of a complex solution as it really requires its own full episode to describe how to design for outriggers. So do you have any other tips for the engineers of what type of things they could, should consider when designing for earthquake? please comment below. And if you did find this video interesting and helpful, please hit that like button. And if you are interested in engineering, hit the subscribe button and to get all updates, you need to ding the bell. And I look forward to being informative in the next episodes. Bye.